Scripture reading today is Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 42. And you can find that in your New Testament on page 120. Acts chapter 2. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I have the pleasure of introducing someone that most of you know already, Dr. Craig Field. Craig is a uh, longtime member of our church. He is an uh, ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church, and Craig recently completed his certificate in ministry at Austin Presbyterian Seminary, uh, which will allow him to do a whole lot more things like this in the future with us as, as part of our congregation and part of his ministry to our congregation. And so I was thrilled uh, at the opportunity to, to share the pulpit uh, a little bit with Craig as we're talking about the sacraments in the Presbyterian Church. And uh, when Craig and I were talking yesterday um, about what to wear when you preach in the traditional service, uh, he asked me if I had a robe, and I said, aren't you a PhD? <laughs> and so the, it's an interesting thing. The gown that you see most pastors wear, um, especially in Protestant traditions, that actually originated as the academic gown because most of the early preachers in the Reformation were also academics. They were professors who taught at university. And so when they ascended into the pulpit to preach, they simply wore the same thing that they wore um, in their classes and in their universities. Craig has more stripes on his sleeve than I do, but I'm, I'm working on that. And so uh, I, I told Craig, it's absolutely fine just to wear your academic gown because that's what we do. You know, as Presbyterians, we certainly value and honor that academic tradition. And uh, so I am thrilled to hear what Craig has to say this morning and please welcome Craig Field. Thank you, thank you very much. Privilege to be here this morning with you and to share what I've learned about uh, Presbyterians baptizing infants. Um, first, I want to say that in terms of the gown, I'm, I, I, I found that quite interesting. I did not realize the connection between academia and the Presbyterian Church. And then I took COVID-19 to mean 19 pounds that you would put on, and so the seamstress could not work fast enough to fix one of my uh, one of my suits so I'm grateful to be here in in the gown today so I wanted to explain why do Presbyterians baptize infants when Neil first offered the opportunity for me to speak in tandem with him about baptism I uh, quickly informed him reminded him that I was raised Baptist and so one of the stranger things for me early on in my Presbyterian faith was to observe the baptizing of an infant, um, and in part that comes from my background as a Southern Baptist, a uh, bit of a confession there that I'm a Southern Baptist. But to understand my view on baptism and infant baptism, you need to know a little bit about the Southern Baptist faith if you don't already. Um, first, I'll give you what I call the congregationalist caveat, which is that Southern Baptists are congregationalists, and that means that each of the congregations has a relative degree of freedom about the way that they carry out core activities of the church. And so there's some differences across congregations, and I mention that in part because my experience may not be the same as your experience, um, and my experience may be different from other experiences that you've heard. So I can only say that this is my experience. I was also obviously a child and adolescent at the time, and so um, may have perceived things a little differently than I would now if I uh, underwent them. But as a Baptist, you are baptized when you make a profession of faith. 
and so you are pretty much an adult. I, in my case, was 16 when I said to my father, I would like to be baptized. Um, I have accepted Jesus Christ into my life. Um, I want to repent for my sins and uh, become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's a, that's a pretty typical uh, scenario, particularly for adolescents. But then for older adults, it is, a, it is a confession of faith. Somebody may be entering into the church um, and then they request, they make a profession of faith, uh, they repent, they become disciples of Christ, and they are baptized. And so they are baptized as adults. And so for a Baptist, baptism is decidedly um, an adult thing. It is something that is carried out with adults um, who are consciously professing, professing publicly professing their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, it's also an act of repentance, and so it's an autonomous act. One of the biggest differences I've noticed between the Baptist faith and the Presbyterian faith is that in the Baptist faith, there's much greater emphasis placed on the individual and the individual taking action as if the individual is stepping toward God so that that implies some active choice on our part. And indeed, that is part of the covenant or the agreement between God and ourselves. But God calls us to him, just as our verse tells us today, um, for everyone whom the Lord calls to him. And so my first infant baptism in the Presbyterian faith struck me as a little strange or odd or different. And I wondered, you know, well, where did this practice come from? Why, why are we doing this? What does it mean? Um, and so I did what any good Baptist would do, which is to say, where in the New Testament does it say that we should baptize infants? And here's the thing, I don't think it does. You can correct me if it's wrong, but I don't know anywhere in the New Testament where it explicitly says, baptize your infants. However, the phrase, the verse that I pointed out today, for his promise is for you and for your children and for all who are after them, all of their descendants and everyone whom the Lord our God, God calls to him. Um, that phrase, that verse comes closest to why we baptize infants in the Presbyterian faith as I could find. You'll notice that that verse begins with four. For his promise is for you and for your children. The fact that it says for says that it's clarifying the verse before. He's adding to the verse that comes before that. Um, so he's clarifying that. And those two verses together, I think, are in some ways yoked together. I think that Acts 38 is uh, indicative of adult baptisms, and Acts 39 clearly tells us that we should be baptizing our infants. Let's take a step back and look at where those two verses are in the New Testament. They appear in the book of Acts, chapter 2, actually. They are a part of... Peter's sermon at Pentecost. But if you'll recall, 40 days after Christ's crucifixion, he ascends into heaven and he tells his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Peter and Paul and the other disciples have been told by Jesus to go out into the world preach the word of God, tell them about my name and my works and the love of God and the grace of God, baptize them, make them Christians. And so that's indeed what they are actively doing in Acts. They're going from place to place, just as described in the reading today. They're going in front of large crowds. They're telling them about the work of Jesus Christ, the love of God, the grace that God has shown through Christ and his crucifixion, and people are being compelled by the word of God, naturally. They're being called into faith, and this verse actually takes place when Peter is offering a sermon at Pentecost, the 50th, 50th day after Christ's crucifixion. The Holy Spirit descends upon the crowd who is gathered 
for the Feast of Weeks. And the crowd, some in the crowd say, what does this mean? What's, what's going on? What's happening? Because obviously this is a powerful, miraculous act. The other part of the crowd is saying, well, they're, they're drinking new wine, they're drunk. And Peter says to them, no, they're not drunk. They're not drunk. This is exactly what the prophet Joel would told us would happen, that he would pour out his spirit upon us and he would call us to Christ. And so some in the crowd are saying, what does this mean? What do we do? And Peter tells them what it is that they should do. He says to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so this very much is to me reflects kind of our attitude or our ideas behind adult baptism. That as people are brought into the church as new members of the church and they are moved by the Spirit of God and they profess their faith, then we baptize them. And that makes all the sense in the world, particularly at the beginning of the church's history, right? We're bringing in new members, they're professing their faith, we're baptizing them, and why do we baptize them? And why do we baptize in infants? And Peter tells us this. He says, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are after them and for anyone that God calls to him. And when he says this verse, he is in some ways alluding to Genesis 17.10 where God says to Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. It shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And Peter in these verses is making connection between the sign of the covenant, the sign of the agreement between God and man in the Old Testament which was circumcision, which was given to Abraham, and the sign of the covenant in the New Testament, baptism. He's making that clear connection there between circumcision is the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament, God gave Abraham circumcision, and in the New Testament, baptism is the sign of the God's covenant in the New Testament. Just like Adam had the tree of life, just like Noah had the rainbow, Abraham had circumcision. But you no longer need to be circumcised. Paul tells us in Colossians 2, 11 and 12, you were circumcised through Christ. Your old nature was cut off with a circumcision made without hands through the crucifixion of Christ. You were buried with him in baptism. You were raised with him through faith. And so you have baptism as the covenant. And so a way, in a way, we can make the connection between circumcision in the Old Testament, which actually called for blood. Blood must be shed as part of the covenant in the Old Testament. And it points to the cross. It points to the coming of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he will make. And in the New Testament, the new sign of the covenant is baptism. Blood has already been shed. Christ has shed his blood for you, and you enter into the faith through baptism. And just like the Old Testament, the sign of God's new covenant is for you and for your family. It is for you and your infants. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized is in some ways a call to be baptized as adults. And Acts 2.39, for his promise is for you and for your children, is clarifying that you indeed are called to bring the sign of the covenant to your children and to your family. And that's indeed how it plays out throughout Acts. We have the, the Philippian, Philippian, Philippian jailer, 
who was converted. We have Cornelius who was converted. Cornelius is baptized and so is his family. The Philippian jailer, Paul is in jail with Silas. They're singing hymns of God. There is an earthquake. That earthquake opens the prison gates so that Paul might flee and the shackles are un, undone, right? And the, the jailer falls to the ground and when he awakes, he fears that his captive has been set free. And Paul tells him from the jail cell, no, we're here, we're here. And he says, the jailer says, what shall I do? And he tells him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And the jailer was baptized at once. He and his family were baptized. We see it again in the conversion of Lydia. Um, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul and she was baptized. She and all her family were baptized. And therefore, baptism, it's not just for adults, it's for infants. Baptism is not just for men, it's for women. Baptism is not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And this is evidence of God's ever expanding grace throughout the New Testament. And so the correct question is not the one I posed to myself and to you. Where does it say that we should baptize infants in the New Testament? The better question is, well, where does it say in the New Testament that we should stop passing on the covenant of God, the sign of the covenant, baptism, to our infants? And indeed, we should. We should. You and your family shall be baptized through the love of God. And so that is the message that I wanted to share with you today as a Reformed Baptist and Presbyterian. And so I'll ask you to stand and pray with me, yes? Dear God, we thank you for the sacrifice that you have made throughout our lives and how have you have called us to you to profess our faith through baptism, and to share that covenant with our children and our congregation and become a part of your covenant and the agreement between you and man that we shall be saved through faith and faith alone. In God's name we pray, amen.